You're listening to Innovators, the podcast from Harris Search Associates, where we speak with global leaders in education, research, engineering, and the health sciences, and ask them to share lessons learned as they continue to advance the frontiers of innovation and discovery. Today's podcast will be led by Rick Skinner, Senior Consultant. More so than most other countries, the United States is home to systems of colleges and universities that take their names from the state in which they are located or in larger states, regions, the institutions were established to serve in that state. These systems usually have a single governing board and an official charge with responsibility for administering the system as a whole. The title of that official is either president or chancellor, but in the spirit of American individualism, there is no hard, fast rule for how the titles are applied. In California, for example, the head of the University of California is that system's president and the heads of the various campuses or chancellors, whereas in the Lone Star State, the head of a system, University of North Texas, for example, is the chancellor and the presidents administer the member institutions. Our guest today on Innovators is probably better equipped for the role of chancellor than most candidates for the job. Lisa Rose spent 33 years with NASA in a variety of posts that equipped her to lead a university system, especially one that evolved quite recently. She earned her undergraduate degree in electrical engineering from the University of Florida and her master's from the University of Central Florida. Anyone who has served as a deputy administrator with responsibility for 17,000 employees at NASA and 10 field centers, director of NASA Langley Research Center, manager of the International Space Station Research Program, and worked on 38 missions of the Space Shuttle and ISS, is not likely to be intimidated at leading a university system. Chancellor Rowe, welcome to Innovators. Thank you very much, glad to be here. I introduced you today with a bit of a tongue-in-cheek remark about the title of Chancellor. Uh, An old boss of mine, Stephen Porch, who was the Chancellor of the University System of Georgia, He often cited the Oxford English Dictionary's 1066 definition of a chancellor as a petty official, guardian of infants, lunatics, and idiots. And then he added, as was his want, not much has changed. (laughs) The position is indeed a formidable one, and the complexity of the mission lends itself to those with experience in post-secondary education, politics, business, and more. So I want to begin by asking you to share what your expectations were of the roles of the position of chancellor of the University of North Texas system and whether those expectations were fulfilled as you envisioned them. In particular, what's the nature of the leadership you and the board expect of you as chancellor? It was pretty clear coming on board. Uh, My board chair made it very, very clear um, that what they wanted was an operator. They wanted someone that had been a COO of a, a, of a company um, mm-hmm. that really knew how to manage operations, that knew how to make things more efficient and effective, that need, knew how to work across all of that. And so bottom line is that's exactly the position that I'm in as chancellor. I'm both CEO and COO of our university system, which is a, a system of three, you know, it's a multi-institutional mm-hmm. uh, system where we have three universities Uh, in multiple locations, and um, six locations I guess we're in now, and we have over 10,000 employees, a $1.3 billion budget, 45,000 students across our uh, three universities, graduating 11,000 annually, so just much like running a large, well, you know, a Mm nice-sized business that's spread out across field centers like NASA, you know, where NASA was a 19... Points at that point when I left, when I retired two years ago, a $19.6 billion agency. We had 10 field centers, and I was the chief operating officer, really kind of running all of those, uh, you know, running those roles across mm-hmm. those centers. So, I'm very similar uh, role here, just kind of a little, you know, a little different focus on the mission. So. Mm-hmm. Let me ask you a follow up on that. A COO. It, Typically, I would have expected in most traditional institutions, they would have said a CEO, but I gather your board really expects you to get down into some of the operational aspects. They did. Uh, Coming on board, uh, there were still things that were that were needing to mature. I mean, they really wanted where across our universities, they wanted our presidents focused on the business of 
running those universities and really mm -hmm. the, the focus on the research and the students mm -hmm. and the things that are the core, I would say, you know, core mission of uh, what we do, core business line, so mm -hmm. to speak. And they wanted really um, services across those institutions running very, very efficiently and effectively. And that's something that I had been doing in NASA mm -hmm. as, you know, as a COO. And, and that means things like Human resources, you know, hiring of people, bringing in the talent, bringing them on board, uh, the procurement that you run across our universities, the facilities that you have mm -hmm. across our various institutions, and making sure that we're doing those things very proactively and uh, very strategic in what we're doing from a master planning standpoint. Um, so it's it's all of those things from you know even legal, you know, it's mm -hmm. so it's those four mm -hmm. things that you might see at a corporate headquarters. For, for many companies, and of course mm -hmm. our board chair at that time, we have now have a new board chair, but uh, was, is uh, Brent Ryan, and ah, yes. is running Ryan, and Ryan's you know worldwide. Exactly. So he had pretty much in mind what he what he was looking for from a COO. He has a COO for Ryan. Uh, I've met her, and uh, and so I know, you know what what he's what he's looking for there. And I gather that there was almost a direct application of your experience at NASA especially in terms of operational efficiencies and, and, and the like, it was almost direct coming from NASA to University of North Texas. Yes, exactly. NASA, we have been working very much across our mm -hmm. 10 centers to, to streamline operations so that, again, our, uh, our center directors at each of our institutions or each of our field centers there could, mm -hmm. could focus on you know, the core missions, you know, building the spacecraft that we were flying, working on the aeronautics research that we were doing, all of those things, right, and mm -hmm. to make sure that we were running those kind of services that cut across all field centers, um, that everybody didn't need one of their own, right, right. because that just tended to drive up costs. So we were doing that there, and, uh, and that was something that we were proving to be very successful in. And uh, we are definitely improving and are doing qu uh, quite a few things very, very well, and there's still a, a lot of opportunities that, right. we're, uh, that we're working on today here across our, our universities. But, uh, but build, uh, the team building piece with the president mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, feels very much like it did in NASA. Excellent. You mentioned mission, and I want to say, take a little time to talk about mission. I think your career at NASA began maybe four or five years after the goal of putting a man on the moon and then bringing him back safely. Uh, so you started just about the time uh, that great mission was, was put to rest in a way. But I imagine working with NASA employees who had been involved with the moon mission gave you a pretty clear sense of the power of a mission to organize a complex organization, one that was public and private and subject to politics of the best and worst kind, and one that had an array of stakeholders. Now, if that's right, the, the, the development of the University of North Texas spans nearly 130 years. Is there anything approximating NASA's sense of mission that affords the institution a strategic notion of what it needs to do where it needs to go, and for you, what are the clearest indicators of that strategic development? Yes, yeah, so NASA, you know, definitely had a wonderful, you know, it's fabulous, the vision and the mission and the sense of purpose that you had there. For me, you know, working on truly civilization-changing discoveries mm -hmm. was just something that uh, that mattered to me. And uh, and I can tell you, for me, I, I couldn't be somewhere that I didn't feel that. Uh, and coming here, it, it's really getting at that same sense of purpose and that same mm -hmm. sense of mission. I can tell you... For me, uh, you know, and I was in my last four years in NASA was uh, in Washington D.C. and uh, and you could get disconnected with that purpose being. Oh. And I, I I got a joke about the logic free zone of Washington <laughs> D.C. But, uh, but the bottom line is, uh, it, but if you just take a trip out to uh, one of the NASA field centers where mm -hmm. we were building spacecraft that were going to go to planets and to you know, really to make discoveries of other Earth-like planets and other, um, you know, and other uh, galaxies and mm -hmm. such, and just amazing things like that, right? You just get jazzed again, right? Just talking to the researchers and, and get in touch with that sense of purpose. And I would say coming here, that is the same thing I want for our folks, especially here at mm -hmm. our system headquarters, mm -hmm. uh, around our purpose, which is transforming lives and creating economic opportunity through education. You can feel that, right? You can yes. get in touch 
in that, and it matters. And so I want uh, very much our our universities, you feel it every day. You're walking around that campus, sure. you sit down, and you see these students. You talk to these students. Mm-hmm. I go and talk to the faculty, and you and you just get you get that same sense of purpose that you just feel jazzed, as I as I as I say. And so that's what I really want in bringing that here is getting people mm-hmm. in touch with that purpose, what we're doing, and feeling that sense of belonging because in doing that that make that makes a difference and right. uh, we're working on the same you know developing that strategy that cuts, cuts across all of our universities mm-hmm. focused on strengthening our core driving strategic growth creating value across all of our universities and so that's that's really to me that's very much the same kind of thing um, that I did in my 33 years at NASA uh, is really that kind of work Way back in the 1960s, uh, two gentlemen wrote a book about the American university. And, and they've all, they used a phrase one time that's always stuck with me. They said, an American research university is an organized anarchy. And the reason they said that was that the people who work there don't really have to pay attention to what everybody else does. And in fact, if they wish, they don't really have to pay much attention to what anybody does because they are invested with the time, the, and that research can consume them. I gather that you don't have that challenge uh, at, in UNT. No, I, and I don't, uh, you know, our vision of, is about being accessible, caring, innovative community, and mm-hmm. industry connected. So it's mm-hmm. about bringing out the full potential of those we serve. And you can't do that on an island without being connected to where we're going, where mm-hmm. the market mm-hmm needs what companies like that are all over this growing Dallas Fort Worth region what they need uh, and actually the workforce of the future that's going to create all those discoveries and all those things right so um, I know that from being a NASA that workforce is so critical to your future mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. Uh, and so you need to be connected with where those companies are going, where our communities need to be, because obviously a lot of our graduates go back into our communities in mm-hmm. some way. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, so uh, I, 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 connectedness is fundamental to what we do across our universities and all of the visions. It strikes me that, that the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex, in many ways, you, you've, it's been required of you almost as a public institution to not simply grow, but to have multiple locations or, or less, uh, given the sheer size of it, both in terms of population, but also it, geographically, it's such a large, complex region, that what might otherwise be, why don't, why don't everybody come to us? You chose to take, or the system chose to take themselves, the university, to the people. Is that largely the Dallas-Fort Worth engine running that causes that? Well, I think taking our our uh, universities, the people. I mean, it, let's talk about. I mean, I, and I commend our Texas leadership mm-hmm. in developing this 30, 60 by 30 plan. You know, by the year 2030, 60 percent of the population ages 25 to 34 will have a degree or c- credential. So they've set that target out there, and uh, and to do that. Um, you can't do that without really reaching populations in different places. And that's what we're focused on um, at our universities. We're thinking very much around getting to students, that, you know, the first-gen students, students that haven't, you know, we want to be accessible. We want to be uh, there for all of those students. Um, and, and Dallas County is, is an example of that yes. where um, where really only one in ten students are, are now getting that you know, that degree, and we want to make sure, and, and Dallas County is, you know, 1% of the nation. It's got 28,000 high school seniors. That's the size of Arkansas, right, so um, of, their, of their seniors. So, um, so really, in reaching those, we've got something here that we're uh, a clear partner in, and that's the Dallas County Promise, mm-hmm. where the focus is to get uh, all students um, in Dallas County to have that opportunity to get college degree and so 
there already there's 11 current promise districts of the 15 school districts. That's 22,000 high school seniors wow. that are uh, that are a part of that. So it's pretty incredible. And UNT mm -hmm. Dallas is right in the middle. It's in mm -hmm. southern Dallas, right mm -hmm. in the middle of that area where there are so many students that never could have dreamed of college. I'm, I'm a first gen student myself, and if there wasn't Me too. You know, the University of Florida in Gainesville, Florida, I don't. I don't know if I'd have had that opportunity necessarily. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that's why it's so important that we have UNT Dallas right there, providing that accessibility, reaching those students, supporting their needs, and and we have UNT as well. You know, which is it's got as I mentioned, uh, like thirty nine thousand students now at wow. UNT, and, and it's also about being very accessible and affordable, mm -hmm. and uh, one of the best college buys around. So that's that's what we're. That's what we're focused on. UNT Dallas, we have 87% minority and 70% wow. first gen. So that's pretty wow. incredible. That is statistics. remarkable. Uh, and truly changing, changing the nature of Dallas and, mm -hmm. and the work that we're doing there. I have to confess, Texas has always been one of those places that sort of intimidates me. It's so big and it does big things. One of my favorite writers is Lawrence Wright. And I, I quickly point out he's a native son of Texas. And he wrote a book recently that came out called A Journey into the Soul of the Lone Star State. And toward the end of the book, he, he, he writes, and this is a quote, I've lived in a culture that is still raw, not fully formed, standing on the margins, but also growing in influence, dangerous and magnificent in its potential. Now, you've lived and worked at least three states that I'm aware of, Florida, Virginia and Texas all of which have undergone extraordinarily rapid growth and change, especially in their educational systems, and most particularly in their colleges and universities. Then, as you mentioned, in Texas, state government has been absolutely resolute in wanting to see their universities become, number one, preeminent research institutions, and they've provided a lot of resources to help you achieve that. And at the same time, Texas needs to find space for literally hundreds of thousands of additional students, many of them who will be like you and me, first generation college entrants. Now, Texas can do lots of things, but is it possible to reconcile a goal of becoming a preeminent research university and at the same time provide access to college for so many more students? Do those conflict? Is there a way to resolve it if there is a conflict? It is definitely not an or proposition. It doesn't have to be ah. preeminent and an you know, or accessible. I mean, that's mm -hmm. the, the point is, uh, it's an and proposition, and, uh, gotcha. and we've proven it's an and proposition. We've got a tier one university with our UNT flagship university, uh, which means you know they're one in, uh, uh, one of the 131 uh, preeminent uh, research universities in the nation, and. We are right there with accessibility, um, with our students there, and uh, and affordable. So we we proved that we we can do that. And so yes, I think it's a, an and proposition at all of our universities. But certainly, uh, as I mentioned already, UNT Dallas and the work that they're doing in Southern Dallas and uh, and our UNT flagship as well. Well, I'd also just just note that Florida. My 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 family grew up in Florida. My father grew up in fam in Florida. And uh, University of Florida was always considered a heck of a good football team. And now it's generally acknowledged to be one of the great public research universities. But not only that, some of the other institutions, your alma mater, Central Florida, a number of the other institutions are similarly growing both in terms of student enrollment and student access, but at the same time achieving some research milepost that are pretty significant. So it doesn't seem to be a function of just how you organize things. There just seems to be a willingness on the part of state government as much as anything to say, we're going to set high goals and we'll provide you some of the help, but you're going to have to do some of the heavy lifting too. And I gather you've been able to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you're, you're right. You have to make it a focus. Um, you have to realize there may be different needs of mm -hmm. those students that are first year mm -hmm. gen students that maybe haven't had well a family that even knows how to support them. Um, they come from different kind of families and have different have different needs in that. And so um, so we have staff and faculty that are very much 
aware of that and tied in with that and providing the the student experience mm -hmm. and uh, and the things that we need for to retain those students uh, right. so that we don't lose them, we don't have a leaky bucket and lose students somewhere along the way. So it, there's all kinds of things, you know, different student services that are needed, different right. uh, resources that we we put into play, different kind of academic advising that you that you have for diverse students, right? And right. you need to be inclusive in what you do and provide for that. Uh, different kinds of efforts around student well-being in that case. For students that uh, come from poverty, you need to, we have food pantries. We have uh, even services around clothing, right, where students right. would be able to, if, you know, it's not like somebody has a suit or something to go mm -hmm. to an interview. Or, exactly. We provide much more scholarships. We focus a lot of resources around scholarships in mm -hmm. those cases to provide a much lower cost. We are focused on pathways from high school to college. And we do that working very closely with the school districts, the K through 12 school districts, also, also community colleges, to make sure that they're starting to get, those students are getting, having that ability to get exposed to college courses in high school. So they come ready, so they come more prepared than, uh, you know, and we, we, we've learned that uh, any the student that has a chance to take a college level course in high school has a much right. greater success rate when they get to college. And so those are things, some of that is reaching back into the high schools to provide those, uh, some of those is, is work, are working with companies to provide mm -hmm. early college high schools that we, we've done a ter tremendous job here in Dallas with these early college high schools that are focused on particular career paths and get these students in that early, uh, that provides them money from working with these companies, it provides career experience, so it gets them connected, and then they, that, they're that they more likely to succeed in college because they can see their path, they, they are very connected to it. Um, so there's just all kinds of ways to do that. And I, I just don't think you follow the paths of the past, right? You mm -hmm. have to do it differently with different student populations. You know, and I think a word, I, I, I did a little more homework. I, I believe I'm right when I say the Dallas-Fort Worth region is home to about a hundred and something languages that are spoken in the public schools there. So it, it's, it's, the diversity is even more of both an opportunity and a challenge in its complexity. So it's all the more important that students have those opportunities or else you won't have those students in, in your workforce. I, I should say, and um, in our UNT Dallas, especially, mm -hmm. well, all, all of our universities, but uh, they're focused very much on what does Dallas need from a career. So we're so we're right. very much right. focused on priority programs that are going to feed the workforce right back mm -hmm. into Dallas. Yeah. And by and you know you mentioned that, but bilingual teachers is a is a huge oh, need, goodness, and we're producing those. Need. That's just another example. Well, but but uh, then one other example it, I mentioned that pretty early on, or at least reasonably early on, UNT came involved in osteopathic medical school. And, and now you joined with Texas Christian University, an independent institution, and you're going to start, I think it's already admitted its first class of medical school. Yeah, now, we have. There are medical schools popping up just about everywhere across the country, especially in areas that have both population growth and or serious problems of population density, rural areas. What spawned the need for another medical school in Dallas-Fort Worth region? Uh, and, and how, I'm trying to imagine how a private institution and a public institution, how it's possible to, for them to work together. Because when you do a medical school, they, they don't cut you any slack at all. Everything has to be ship shape for LCME to, to give you accreditation. How does that all figure into that mission that we talked about earlier? Well, I guess the bottom line is there's, there's a physician shortage in Texas, and uh, prior to launch of our uh, TCU, UNT Health Science Center School mm -hmm. of Medicine, there was an MD, there was, there's no MD school in, uh, in Tarrant County, and it's, that's a county with two million people, and so uh, this new MD school fills this need in the state. Uh, mm -hmm. It puts a medical school right in uh, one of the state's largest counties. One of the critical parts about an MD school too is the the internship, right? The the yep. so you need these gradical graduate medical education slots, GME slots, for doctors to learn to practice, right? With these 
with these affiliated hospitals. Mm-hmm. What the data shows is that a doctor tends to stay where they do their internship. Exactly. And exactly. so a key part of what uh, our President Williams did at our UNT Health Science Center is forge these partnerships. Uh, so he's created 600 new GME slots um, for these medical students now coming out of our new MD school with TCU. Mm-hmm. And, and now that will not only, you know, graduate uh, more MDs, but keep them right here exactly. in this area where there's a need. So it's a, it's a, it's a really exciting. Um, you're right, it's a public-private partnership. I think it's the only one. Uh, it's the only that, one I'm aware of. That we're aware of, too. So, um, so we're pretty excited. We're forging the way. You know, it's, it's not something that some of the accreditation organizations are, are used to, but uh, it's something that we're, <laughs> we're working with them on and forging the way. And, uh, and it, it, it is exciting. We have a different kind of curriculum that we're, we're focused on as well. We're focused on very much a patient-based approach where, and a team-based approach where students are really learning to do that. And that's a team with the pharmacy students as well, where different, depending on what the patient needs, the particular area of healthcare will lead that team. So it could be the pharmacist, it could be, you know, the doctor at that. So it's so it's so it's exciting to watch some of that happening and being a part of that. So yes, we're we're excited to to be doing something new, exciting, different and needed right here in uh, in our community. As you probably know, we've been talking about interprofessional education and interprofessional health care probably for 35, 40 years. It sounds as though you may be actually making it happen. So Good luck to you. Thank I had the you. pleasure recently of interviewing the, the president, provost, and the CFO of Northern Illinois University, all of whom are women. Uh, and that's a real rarity in higher education. You're the first woman to head the UNT system, and you were the first woman, I believe, to direct NASA's Langley Research Center. And I think if I probably dug back to junior high or even elementary school, I'd find out that you were the first female to do a whole bunch of things. So that just speaks to who you are. On the other hand, the percentage of women presidents of chancellors of colleges and universities is pretty much stuck at about 30%. And that number sticks out because women now make up the majority, not just of students enrolled, but those who graduate. So I'm gonna put you on the spot. What is it that causes you to be the exception to the rule when it comes to women leading in higher education? Well, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Uh, I, I can tell you, when I was named chancellor of the University of North Texas system in 2017, after spending 33 years in NASA, uh, the Dallas Morning News ran this article about UNT breaking this glass. And, and I thought, really? Seriously? There's not been a woman chancellor here? You know? but, but I think that tells you, uh, for me, it, I, it didn't matter. I don't really think I don't have to see some somebody that looks like me ahead of me to feel like I can do something. I don't. I don't even think about it, quite frankly. Uh, you know, when I when I became the first center director, woman center director at NASA Langley Research Center in uh, in Hampton, Virginia, and it's and, you know it's in a hundred year history. At yes. that time, it was not five years, but now it's over a hundred. It was funny because this. Um, my, the, the wonderful woman, her name's Selena, that cleaned cleaned our offices there. Uh, she she came up to me uh, that first day I was in the office, and she had tears in her eyes, and she hugged me, and she said, "Finally," and uh, and and I realized to so many people that it matters, right? That they see mm-hmm. some, they, they have to see mm-hmm. somebody to realize they could break the glass that I didn't even know existed, right? I didn't even pay any attention to the to the glass. You know, you, you just don't let, let anybody tell you you can't. Uh, you know, I think, I, I believe in that saying, how it goes, it's uh, if you believe you can or you can't, you're right, and, uh, mm-hmm. and I, I believe I can. Mm-hmm. And that's just kind of the way I, I run until apprehended, and I haven't been apprehended yet. So. <laughs> I think you're a little modest, ma'am. I'm sorry, I think you're just a tad modest. But uh, we'll let you off, but before we go, uh, we like to have our, guest sort of leave something behind for our listeners are there one or two things you'd like to leave behind that you would want people to know about the university of north texas system oh i want them to know we have something very exciting going on we have a hundred plus acre campus in frisco which is 
probably the fastest growing city mm -hmm. in the nation, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's just uh, uh, just growing like crazy. And we're so excited to be partnered there um, and be a part of that community. We're doing things new and different there as well. So I want to leave people with, you know, we're designing what is needed right there in that Frisco community uh, and really transforming lives there and also being very community connected and industry connected. It's, I've never seen a partnership like we have with the economic development there, the mayor there, the high schools there, the community colleges there. We're really creating something pretty unique and exciting. And uh, we're, we're launching new curriculum that uh, is different. We're doing project design and analysis-based mm -hmm. curriculum. And our students this fall started in that where they're much of their degree is focused on paid internships and industry partnerships and working on key projects that are needed right there in the Frisco area. So um, that's, to me, exciting. Uh, I think it's providing these seamless learning experiences for our students that I'm not sure is being done anywhere else. So I want to leave our listeners with there's exciting things going on uh, across our University of North Texas system, system and uh, come be a part of it. Chesler, I want to thank you very, very much for this, your time today. Uh, let me just offer you one thing. As, a, as an elderly gentleman, I like to think of myself in that way, who has two daughters and then two granddaughters, uh, even the cats in this house are all women. Uh, it's inspiring to see females in leadership positions because as my daughters and granddaughters and my wife like to tell me, women are so much smarter than men anyway. Thank you very much for your time today and we'll have some folks coming down to see you in Dallas, all right? All right, great. Thank you. Glad to be here. Thank you for listening to Innovators, a production of Harris Search Associates. We'll have more insightful conversations with global thought leaders to follow.